Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your praying. Now, uh, Carol Matthew has a Mother's Day gift that she's going to share with the rest of us. Her two daughters coming to bless us.
He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everybody brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. This, the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee, he thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Now friends, what we're going to see as we look at this with God's help and the Holy Spirit, that Mary here demonstrated a resolve to help the wedding party that jump-started Jesus' ministry. Now here's what we're going to see first. Mary saw a problem and knew that Jesus could solve it. Then we're going to see Jesus' solution, and then we'll see the significance of that solution. Mary saw the problem. The wine ran out before the guests did. And we look at this and we think, yeah, what's the big deal? At least, as a man, I do. I mean, really? Is this a big thing? Well, let's consider their culture, not ours. In their culture, a wedding was a rare reason to celebrate. And families came together, and the men folk came together, the women folk came together, and it was a week-long observance. The formation of a new family was, was celebrated over an entire week. And these were people who had uh, very little means, but used all their means to try to get the couple started on this uh, celebratory note. And the other thing that's very different from our culture to theirs is that these people regarded honor as being very important. <coughs> the family name, and the, the honor of the bridal party was at stake. And this was something that Jesus' mother Mary felt very keenly. She was very sympathetic to the bride and the bridegroom. She did not want to see them be dishonored by having run out of wine at the party. So, we ask the question, is Mary being a stage mom in this situation? Is she prodding Jesus a little bit? And I want to say yes, and I want to tell you three reasons why that come from the text. The first of those reasons is that Mary, uh, and what we're going to see in all three of these, is that Mary was tactful but assertive. Okay, Tactful but assertive. Three things. First is... Jesus' reply to her. Second is the instructions that she gives to the servants. And then third, the outcome. Jesus did what she asked. Kind of asked. First thing, Jesus' reply to Mary was rather pointed. Look at verse 4. Dear woman. Now, what he's doing here with those two words is taking her status as mother off the table. He doesn't say, oh, mom, uh, as we have done on more than one occasion, probably. But he addressed her respectfully and affectionately, but implies here that he's not going to do it just because she's his mother. There's something more important at stake here, sorry, and uh, keep that in mind as we go on. The second part of his reply, why do you involve me, proves that Jesus understood that Mary's words were not a simple observation of fact, but a request. And so I believe she said them to him in a, in a tone of voice, you know, the voice, the mom voice that says, uh, uh, don't just hear what I say, but do something about it. And he caught that. And in reply to her, he says, why do you involve me? She didn't say his name. 
Didn't tell him what to do. Her comments were very innocent on the surface, and yet very assertive beneath them. And his objection is the third part. My time has not yet come. This was not the moment that Jesus would have chosen for himself to begin his public ministry. This was not the, the time or the event that he thought, hmm, sure, this is, this is where we need to go public. He's assembled some disciples at this point, but hasn't really launched his ministry. And a wedding in Galilee? Yeah, not a very public place. Well, what is the jumping point that Jesus chose? According to John's Gospel, look at what happens the very next thing in chapter 2. What did Jesus do? He went to Jerusalem and kicked out the money changers and the merchants in the temple. Now that's a splashy beginning. That's a good macho start. Yeah, I'm coming in and I'm taking over. I'm kicking all you out of here. That's a way to begin a public ministry. But Mary had a different idea. And, as it turns out, so the second point we see here is her instructions to the servants put Jesus on the spot. So she makes her a request that's not a request in verse 3. He makes his objection that's not much of an objection in verse 4. And then in verse 5, she turns to the servants and says, whatever he tells you, do it. Wow. Thanks, moms. And I think at that the text doesn't say it, but if I were if I were portraying this in a film or on the stage, I would have Mary just turn around and leave. You know, whatever he says to do, just go ahead and do it. And then walk off confident that he was going to do it. And as we see, he did. Now Mary didn't know how he was going to do it. That's why her instructions are very vague. But she knew that the power was in his hands. And that he could do it. Now, the third thing that we see happening that, that I think supports this theory that Mary is being a little bit of a stage mom here is that he did what he asked, what she asked. He did what she wanted. In verses 6 to 10, Jesus Christ honored his mother by fulfilling her request. Friends, that is no small thing. That is a big thing. He honored his mother. And in this culture, honoring one's parents is a big thing. It should be in ours too. But in their culture, in the Old Testament law, they grew up in a culture that said those who disobey their parents, who are dishonoring to their parents, deserve the death penalty. Wow. So something that they took much more seriously. Now, let's go to Jesus solving the problem in verses 6 to 10. How did he do it? Well, Jesus had no financial means to solve the problem. He didn't have enough money to go down to the 7-Eleven and pick up a few cases of wine. That was not on the table. So a miraculous solution was to follow, and in the miracle, Jesus used what was at hand. Look at what the text tells us in verse 6. There were stone jars there. And those jars had already been put to use. They provided water for the washing ceremony that was part of Jewish culture. And Jesus looked at them and said, okay, I can do this, no problem. And he instructed the servants to fill the jars, to refill the jars. And notice that the detail here that they filled them to the brim. These are very obedient people. You know, we say, oh, it's hard to find good help. Ah, they had good help there. They filled those jars almost above and beyond what had been expressed to them. The miracle provided the ultimate solution. And when I say ultimate, I mean the very best solution possible. Now these jars would hold up to 180 gallons. So there is a quantity 
of miracle here that we need to understand. At no time in this text you will notice that Jesus did, did he touch the jars. At no time did he touch the water. At no time does he use the word water or wine in reference to what happens. So this is a, a very hands-off approach giving God the Father clearly the credit for this miracle. And he simply says, dip out some and take it to the master of the banquet. Now the master of the banquet in that culture was the person who was in charge of the food and the drink and the servants. Uh, might, we might refer to that person today as a wedding coordinator. Something like that. And so he takes a sip and is so enthusiastic that he takes the groom aside and imagine being this poor guy takes the groom aside and says, wow, you know, most of us, we give out the good stuff first, and then after everybody's had a little too much, then we bring out this other stuff. But you, my boy, you saved the best for last. We were just so happy about that. This addresses the miracle of the quality of the wine. So Jesus, in, in grace and in generosity, performs a miracle of quantity and quality. Now, should teetotalers be concerned about Jesus miraculously producing an alcoholic beverage? Well, you'll have to read the blog on Monday to find out the answer to that. We don't have time to talk about that now. Let's go to the significance of this. What, what's the big deal here? Verse 11 tells us, John, in his writing, his gospel, does not leave it up to you and I to decide that this was a good way to start Jesus' public ministry. We don't, we're, it's not left up to us to decide whether this miracle is important or not. Instead, John supplies three reasons why this miracle is legit, if you want to use that word. First reason. This was the first, he says in verse 11, of the miraculous signs that Jesus performed. Now we need to understand what the Bible means by that. Miracles were offered as proof to authenticate the claims of the speaker. And so Jesus coming along and telling people, hey, I'm the Son of God. The miracles were given so that people would believe him when he said that. They authenticated his identity and verified his claims. In fact, at one point Jesus says, look, if you're not going to believe my teaching, at least believe on the basis of the miracles. But they speak for themselves. So it's the first miracle. You know the first, that's always important. I say that because I'm firstborn. But first things are important, right? We all recognize that. And John says so here, so we're not going to argue with it. Second reason, the miracle revealed the glory of Jesus. And friends, glory is in the Bible is of the presence of God. That's what that word really means, that God is present. And so Jesus, in doing this miracle, in this little wedding, in this little town, in this little province, far away from the beaten path, revealed the glory of God. Think about it. Wouldn't you want that for your wedding? God revealing his glory. Third reason, it caused his disciples to put their faith in him. Is this a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. It caused his disciples to put their faith in him. He's been assembling some disciples here in the latter half of chapter 1. And that's who's being talked about here in verse 11. That they went, wow, he's Jesus. He's really something. 
and they would have more occasions to say so as the three years together would unwind. So friends, I want to say to you this morning that these three observations here in verse 11 place a very high value and give great theological importance to this miracle. Now, you might say, well, it's a wedding. I mean, with Lazarus, the miracle was literally a matter of life or death. But this verse, these ch this chapter says to us, no, this was very important. And we're to remember at the beginning of this, the, the one that turned the key that got all of this started was Jesus' mother, Mary. Now here's some, as we close here, here's some famous quotes from various mothers in a similar situation to Mary. Jonah's mother, for example, said to him, Oh, that's a nice story, Jonah. But now tell me, where have you really been the last three days? <laughs> Where the Mona Lisa's mother, after all that money your father and I spent on braces, Mona, can't you smile? <laughs> or Columbus's mother, I don't care what you've discovered, you still could have written. Thomas Edison's mother said to him, of course I'm glad you invented the electric light bulb, Thomas. Now turn it off and go to bed. <laughs> and Superman's mother said, Clark, your father and I have discussed it and we've decided to get you your own cell phone so you don't have to spend all that time in phone booths. <laughs> Here's the thing that both scripture and biology Confirm. Mothers. Everybody's got one. <clears throat> our relationship with our mother is illustrated by this passage this morning. It's supposed to be one of those things that compels us to seek God. To join with him in advancing the cause of righteousness in our world. And all of the forces that are at work in the world that want to atomize us, that want to individuate us, that want to separate us from one another. These are contrary to the word and will of God. May Father's Day and Mother's Day and Grandparents' Day and Children's Day and all of these others serve a greater purpose than sentiment. May they serve us as reminders to love one another, to do good deeds, and to draw each other closer to God. Amen? We're going to sing number 684. Precious Lord, take my hand. We'll sing the first two verses. We have it in your bulletin. We have it in the hymnal. Let us stand and sing our thanks and praise to the Lord for what he is doing, what he has done, what he will do.